Hi everyone and welcome to my channel. I am Rachel and this is RRD Creates, where we create, educate, and inspire. So today we're talking about vendor events or craft fairs, whatever you call them in your neighborhood. But we're going to go ahead and break down the basics. You know, what is a vendor event? What can I expect from one? And how do I turn a negative experience into a positive one for my business? But first, let's go ahead and hear from our sponsor. Now that the bills are paid, let's get into this. So today, again, we're talking about vendor events 101. So let's talk about what a vendor event is in the first place. Uh, basically, a vendor event is any festival or fair or swap meet where you can pay to have a table or a booth and sell to customers. So finding these events is super easy. You can usually type in festivals near me, festivals, and then insert your town here, um, street festivals, street carnivals, you know, just kind of Google it, figure out what's going on in your area. A lot of times you'll find out there's all kinds of like festivals happening almost every weekend, regardless of how large your city is. So look it up, see what works out best for you. When it comes to a vendor event, you really want to know who goes to these things, how old are they, what are their interests, where else would they shop, you know, if it's a flea market type of a thing, or if it's more of a craft fair where people really appreciate handmade goods. So you want to do your research ahead of time. And in order to get accepted into these things, you usually have to put in an application. Sometimes applications are more robust than others. The bigger the event, the more you have to prove you are worth being there. So firstly, you're going to go ahead and fill out that application. And in that application, they usually want some images, some proof of sales, some social media proof that you actually are a reputable business. So why do they need to know if you have a social media? You know, I don't have one. What am I supposed to do? You have to have a social media account. It's 2020. Like, you know, half of us can't even leave our houses anymore. So you need to be meeting people where they are. And the fastest mode of communication nowadays is via social media. So when a big festival is looking for someone to be a part of it, they want to make sure that you have a social media presence and that you are going to promote their event just as hard as they're going to promote it. Because who else is going to come to these events if they're the only people that are kind of bragging about the fact that they're having a vendor event? They have to have the vendors do most of the work for them. So they're relying upon you to promote, get some people in there, get some traffic, because, you know, we don't expect your friends and family to purchase at your booth, but they could purchase at someone else's booth. So, you know, if you have an event with 100 stalls, then 100 vendors could be promoting this event and it could have a huge amount of traffic. So you need to have your social media put together. There are tons of, um, you know, digital marketing podcasts and everything else out there. And if that's something you want to learn more about, I'm happy to go into it. Um, but I would check out the Gold Digger podcast, G-O-A-L Digger podcast by Jenna Kutcher because I am obsessed with all of her social media tips and they've helped out me and my clients for years. So basically, you got to prove who you are to these people on paper or in an online application and provide a deposit. A lot of times you're paying for your booth space. So that can be 25 to $250 to have a little space to sell your goods. So that's something to be mindful of as well. When you're booking these events, you know, do you have that money to put up front and hope that someone on the other side purchases enough from you at the event to kind of cover your costs? So you get everything turned in. You finally are waiting for that perfect email where they say that you're accepted and you are. So even now that you're accepted into the vendor event, this is where all the real work kind of begins. Uh, vendor events are always a gamble. There's always risks involved. There's just no guarantee that you're going to make a single dime at these events because there's just too many variables to account for. In my opinion, you know, some are worth the risk and some aren't. Basically, anything in a middle school gym is a no. <laughs> you know, those little carnivals that your kids have in the gymnasium or in the auditorium, you know, those are not the place to have a real business show up. You know, you're just not going to make the money you think you will. Because, you know, even if there's a $0 booth fee and that kind of thing, you're relying upon 
a school event <laughs> to be populated by tons of people and those people who are already being hounded for money from the school via, you know, I know my niece always is selling popcorn or trash bags or, or you name it, they're buying something. Like there's always a fundraiser at school, um, you know, and then also there's an added pressure at many schools that any of your sales at the event go back to the school. So it's all a hot mess, you know, so there's really no reason to be a part of a middle school gym vendor event because not only are you just losing money just right out the gate, <laughs> regardless of how things go, but you're also just going to be surrounded by people who aren't interested in your product per se. You might be able to shake a few hands, but you can do that elsewhere. Um, you know, going forward, the next thing that is kind of like a red flag to me is any kind of event that has a ton of LuLaRoe or Avon or Mary Kay booths, you know, if they accept those, then you're already at a disadvantage because, you know, even though you don't sell the same things as them, um, you know, let's take for instance, you know, maybe I'm going and I'm selling, you know, my handmade apparel and gifts that are sewn, crocheted and knitted. Um, LuLaRoe can't offer, you know, that handmade experience, but <laughs> They can offer four pairs of leggings for 20 bucks. You know, I can't do that. I'm not going to do that. I'm not interested in doing that. So if you're sitting next to that booth, you're already at a disadvantage. You have two different target markets. Two different audiences are interested in your stuff. But it's hard to overcome the I'm selling a $40 wool poncho and she's selling, you know, leggings that you could buy 18 of for the same price. So it's just not a good look. Um, it's like, you know, be, me being McDonald's and just deciding to pop up shop in the middle of like a Ruth Chris steakhouse. Like it just doesn't make any sense. So <laughs> there's just different, different strokes for different folks. But, you know, if the event is small and you're right next to a LuLaRoe booth, you're just at a disadvantage as an apparel maker, you know, basically. Um, I've actually had the experience where someone has commented on my prices in comparison to their prices, which was just maddening <laughs> to me. So, um, you know, realize that LuLaRoe people are really sweet people just trying to make money, just like all of us. However, the way that they do it is by just reselling merchandise, whereas we as creative entrepreneurs are creating an experience, we're creating products, and we're passing that on to our customers. So it's just a completely different vibe. And, you know, if a vendor event has thousands of booths open and, you know, you're going to be in the handmade center, then that just makes more sense than a smaller fair that just takes anybody. So uh, just bear that in mind. Um, lastly, something I want to touch on is the fact that many vendor events are now requiring admission fees. Um, it really kind of covers them if there's low traffic. So say I'm having a huge vendor event, but I'm not sure if everybody's going to show up and I'm going to have my bills paid. Basically, you know, they have to take care of food, water, you know, renting the space, parking, you know, there's a lot that goes into it as a vendor event, you know, kind of runner, <laughs> whatever you want to call them. So they'll sometimes do an admission fee to make sure that their costs are covered. Because when it comes to your booth pay, like maybe I pay 50 to $100 to have a booth at a big vendor event, you know, that it can only go so far. So that said, you know, if there's an admission fee of 10 to $25, it's a big risk to you as the vendor um, because you're now even, mo even less likely, <laughs> even more or less likely to make a sale. Um, if you think of it, I, I don't know about you, but usually, you know, in my family, we usually run on budgets. You know, before I go somewhere, I assume oh, I'm probably going to pay 20 bucks. You know, oh, I'm probably going to, you know, a lot for 100 bucks at this event. So if someone has allotted 100 bucks at this event and is excited, you know, for a day out with their family, their husband, whatever. OK, if they pay $25 at the door, now it's down to 75 okay, well, now they need lunch. Okay, well, lunch at these events is usually overpriced. So now we're down to 50. <laughs> so you and everyone else in the event is competing for $50 from this one customer. 
you know, so would someone buy your $50 handmade uh, sweater or would they pay $50 elsewhere for two or three things at, from various different booths? You know, there's just different ways to think of it. And in my opinion, you know, anything that has a high admission fee, you just don't bother with if you're just starting out. Um, you know, if you're a huge bustling business down the road, go for it. Um, I've had plenty of success, <laughs> you know, paying a thousand dollars for a booth. And then, you know, on the flip side, I'm making 10,000 a month. You know, these are things that you have to be mindful of. But there are some benefits, even if you find yourself in any of those worst case scenarios. In the event that you end up at a place and, you know, your target market isn't there, um, maybe it got rained out, or maybe you weren't aware of an admission fee, but suddenly there was and traffic is down, you basically have the opportunity to treat it as a learning and growing experience, um, more importantly, a marketing experience. So this all starts as soon as you get the acceptance letter to being a vendor, the thing you need to do is start documenting. You need to videotape what you're doing. You need to take photos of what you're doing. Um, you need to follow yourself all along the process. If you're a designer like me, you need to go ahead and record yourself drawing, record yourself sewing, record yourself crocheting, whatever the case is, and build up the interest from your social media base that you're going to be at this event, you know, brag about it, whatever. Um, you know, so even if no one comes, you have a ton of marketing materials that you can utilize year over year, you know, for any throwback Thursdays you want to do, any flashback Fridays, um, you know, anything you really want to utilize that for. You can use it as portfolio work for the next vendor event um, because they're not going to ask you how much money you made at the last vendor event. No one's really keeping track of those kinds of things, but putting yourself out there is usually the most impressive thing. So curated content showing your process of getting your vendor event booth started, finished, and complete, and then taking pictures of, of the booth once you're there. Um, mix that in with, you know, some really nice business cards, brochures that you hand out in each bag that you, you know, give to people or, you know, sell to people. That is just the easiest way to utilize this opportunity for marketing. And the best part is, you know, even if you don't make money today, or maybe you lost money in your booth, you can write it off at the end of the year as a marketing expense. It's totally deductible. So, you know, don't put your last $50 into a vendor event if you can't afford it. But if you got 50 bucks and you've got some inventory and you're going to push yourself to make more inventory, go for it because it's going to be totally fine. You can write off most things. You can write off the gas it took you to go there. You can write off you know, the money that you put into advertising and promotions, you can put, take off money for the brochures that you made, the vinyl banners that you made, that's all tax deductible. As long as you have your business licenses in place, you can really, you know, take advantage of every opportunity as a, you know, marketing expense, basically, you know, obviously talk with your lawyers or whatever, but, you know, for the most part, this is pretty innocuous. So when it comes to, you know, the vendor event, we've kind of gone over, you know, how to find one, what to do once you're in one, and how to make sure that it is a positive experience, even if it's just for marketing. Um, so I'm going to just touch lightly on what to sell at vendor events. Um, it's kind of a generic topic because everyone makes different things. Um, but in general, if you've done your research, you know who is coming to this event. You know who's coming to the vendor event. You know who's coming to the craft fair. You know what they're used to seeing. Um, so you can choose to either rebel against that or you can choose to fall in line. So if somebody, you know, invites you to be at a vendor event and they all sell quilts, you know, you can choose to also sell quilts. Or maybe your quilts are for young teens or kids or something like that. Or you can be a little different. You can offer a couple quilts along with some quilted pot holders, quilted backpacks, quilted shirts, jackets, whatever the case may be, just to separate yourself out from kind of what the norm is. Um, that's also a great way to kind of get more traffic to your booth is to be different. You know, it's nice to have the classics, but if you're not different, then you're not new and fresh and interesting to pop over to. You know, um, another thing to think about is your display. 
Um, we can definitely get into this more and check out RRD Creates YouTube as we kind of follow that process um, all the way to fruition. Uh, but your display needs to be interesting, even if your favorite color is black, which mine is. <laughs> you need to have something with a pop of color to get somebody in your booth. Um, even if that item never sells, even if that you know table of items never sells, you just need people to stop and be interested enough to have a chat with you, and then they can peruse. You know, you are sitting there being the best salesperson you have, so <laughs> you need people to be able to stop and stare. You know, would you go into Neiman Marcus if they didn't have a great kind of opening display? Would you go to Bergdorf's if they didn't have an opening display that was really cool? You know, you might not be able to afford anything in there, but it got you interested. So definitely think about your display pretty heavily. And lastly, when it comes to selling at vendor events, you want to cover as much ground as possible. And what I mean by that is, you know, I personally love winter and fall. You know, when I dress in the morning in the winter and fall, all I wear is leggings, a poncho, <laughs> a shirt, obviously, and some fake Ugg boots, you know, possibly a blanket scarf if it's extra chilly. So with that in mind, the thing that you should do is try to appeal to people like yourself. That's the easiest way to get some product out there. You know, if you have tons of girls in your area that love blanket scarves, guess what? Makes blanket scarves. And, okay, well, what goes well with a scarf? A hat, okay? You have to think of adjacent products. If I'm shopping for winter wear, I need to be warm. So I need hat, scarf, gloves. If you can't make gloves, make, you know, leg warmers. Make, you know, <laughs> you know there's different ways to broaden what you sell so that you can appeal to as many people as possible. You know, in my opinion, you know, my target market is between, you know, 25, 35 years old. They have kids. They might not have kids. And they're just, you know, interested in staying trendy. And sometimes they buy some gifts for their kids or their teen cousins and nieces and nephews and that kind of thing. So if I just sold things for the person who's purchasing, I would only be, you know, really helping them out in purchasing things for themselves but in the holidays they're usually buying gifts and things for others so you need to think about you know how can I broadly offer products that will appeal to someone to buy for themselves and to buy for others because it's just that great another way to think of it is you know an allegory I use all the time with my clients and that is you go to the gas station and do they only sell gas? No, absolutely not. That's ridiculous. <laughs> you know, those years are long gone. So a gas station is a perfect example of, you know, they're thinking of their customer and they're thinking of what they need now, what they need later, and what they don't think they need, but they might pick up anyway. So when I'm driving, I'm usually driving, you know, here or there, you know, I might just buy something real quick. I forgot to pick up milk. I forgot to pick up eggs. It's at the gas station. It's overpriced, but it's there. So I'll grab it, you know, so that I don't have to make two stops. You know, that convenience is worth it for me. Um, you know, when I'm driving long distance, I'm in the car for, you know, eight to 12 hours. Okay, well, what do I do in that situation? Well, I stop at the gas station. Well, good thing they have food. They have snacks. They have um beverages, monster energy drinks, those are my favorite. Um, some of them have, you know, whole restaurants now. Um, you know, those are just like easy things that a traveler would need. And then you go a step further. Oh man, I'm running late to this business appointment. What else would I need? Okay. They've got gum, they've got energy drinks, you know, these, this is how a business is run. You know, there is no business that only sells just one thing and is successful. You know, those product-based businesses have, you know, they may start with one thing, but they always branch out. So my encouragement to you when it comes to vendor events is to think of the product that everyone loves or that you feel everyone will love and think of something else that they would also love. If they love your beautiful glitter tumblers, why wouldn't they love a beautiful glitter wine glass? You know, just think of the next step. It doesn't have to be outside of the box craziness. You know, if you offer crew neck t-shirts, maybe some people would like v-neck t-shirts. If you sell tank tops, maybe they would like a racer back. Just think of the adjacent 
product that would easily be made by you and easily appeal to the same group that you're already talking to. Um, you know, all that said, I want to encourage you to get out there, start researching vendor events in your area. Of course, COVID has taken that away from us to some extent, um, you know, but with the right amount of gloves, the right amount of hand sanitizer and masks for everyone, <laughs> um, you know, I'm sure that we'll come out of this in a better place because I know personally I've seen a number of huge retailers go down, you know, during this year and everything just seems to be pushing towards these small businesses like you and me. So, you know, go research, see what vendor events are out there, you know, start studying your target audience. What are you going to make? And, you know, definitely leave some comments, leave some love on RRD Creates Instagram or RRD Creates YouTube channel uh, because I would love to follow your progress. Send me an email, send me a message. Again, I'm Rachel. This is RRD Creates and you have a great rest of your day.